get weird sounds from people in Pittsburgh when I tell them I went to school in Cleveland, but that's where I went to school. Uh, this is my alma mater, the Cleveland Institute of Art. When I attended it, the building didn't look this nice. This was years of uh, taking my student loan tuition. Um, <laughs> the student loans that built this. Um, and I went to graduate school at Kent State University where I got my MFA. Uh, for me, it was this, this change, um, this experiential change um, in terms of the type of people that I was used to engaging with. So growing up in New York City, I was around copious amounts of cultures that were different than myself. And because we were all different, difference didn't matter, right? Everyone was identified as being unique, bringing a unique attribute, but then going to school in Cleveland at the Cleveland Institute of Art, I now began this journey where I was one of few black people. And in some regards, for many of my classmates, I was the first black person that they met. Um, in fact, I often joke that my roommate, Derek, couldn't tell the difference between Malcolm X and DMX the rapper. <laughs> it's funny now, it wasn't funny to me then. But uh, it showcased the lack of awareness that people had to others that are different than themselves and the nuances and experiences that you have based on those differences. The fact that I was one of few inspired my academic pursuits in graduate school. My thesis was titled Chasing Vertical. For those that are unfamiliar, there was a World War II study um, that basically put people into a crooked room and wanted to study how crooked the room can be um, before people realized that the room was not straight. So they would put them in this crooked room and tilt it at different angles and then ask people to align the fixtures on the wall and the chairs to make it a straight room. There was an author named Melissa Harris Perry who made the argument that being black or being of a marginalized audience, uh, a marginalized identity is actually sitting in a crooked room and perpetually attempting to straighten the space that you're in, um, which is an impossible task because the entire room itself is crooked. Uh, my thesis explored um, lack of diversity in the field of design and what uh, attracted students of color to study, if not design, especially considering at the time of my thesis, we were seeing record numbers of black and brown students in collegiate spaces, but none of those numbers are being reflected in design practice. I went through several rounds of research studies. Um, my literature review, uh, actually looking at the census from 1991, found that only 2% of practicing designers of all fields happened to be black. And by time I presented my thesis and defended it, in 2017, we had a huge increase of 3%, um, where we went from 2% black to 5%. The question of design uh, and the lack of diversity actually was something that major organizations, such as AIGA, spent a considerable amount of time trying to find solutions for. Um, one of the things I often find really interesting is the fact that this article um, discussed uh, a conference that happened through AIGA April 1st, 1991 at my high school. Um, so for me, it, it feels like a, a weird circle that the high school that I went to without any of the teachers that were there for this conference uh, ended up being the uh, ground zero for discussions that I ultimately ended up taking as a graduate student in Ohio. Um, I also listened to conversations and lectures by uh, my now mentor, Murray Sherry, who's the host of the Revision Path podcast, who did a 2015 uh, South by Southwest presentation where the black designers also exploring this issue. Um, what I found, uh, based off several studies, was that the majority of black and brown college students were actually interested less in doing uh, design for design's sake because it comes off as a luxury brand. Uh, the way that design is traditionally communicated at most institutions is uh, come study with us. We'll teach you all the latest new trends and tricks and you'll be able to work with Fortune 500 companies and design products and services that the people from your community may not be able to afford. However, the programs that typically tend to attract them are programs that speak to people uh, about being change agents or speak to them about uh, empowering them with the talent and skills necessary to advocate for those that they care for. Uh, so I did this huge ethnographic study where I went through and looked at I began doing media scans of different universities 
in order to see how they identify their programs. Uh, so we, we, I also started looking at studies that detailed where black and brown students were going. Georgetown University actually did a entire paper on how the majority of black and brown students are in social science fields. So things that give higher social return on investment versus financial return on investment. Um, and the fields that we were studying were fields like uh, sociology, psychology, pre-law, things of that nature that would give them the ability to advocate for um, the people that they cared for. Um, I began doing card sorts where I would go and find uh, students and professionals working in these industries asking them, if you can organize these cards based off of level of importance from salary, diversity, inclusion, impact, fun, and creativity, um, and prioritize them in terms of what helps you decide what type of job to take or career to take. Um, what I ended up finding was that for social science uh, participants, the majority of them cared more about impact than anything else. The ability to impact the community that they cared for superseded everything else. So if this is where black and brown students were going and design itself was not communicating itself in that fashion, that's why we were missing so many of those students. They were looking for tools to be change agents and advocates rather than simply being people that would design logos, um, products, or services for a Fortune 500 companies. Um, they wanted to be able to have impact on the community around them. Based off of my research, I ended up building out personas. You had the, enthusi the enthusiast, uh, basically the person who met a, a teacher or a, a mentor who, who who practice in this particular field and wanted to follow in that person's footstep. Uh, the direct exposure, uh, someone who had difficulty in a particular uh, instance. Um, in, some, in some cases, uh, some of the people that I interviewed were former adoptees or people who had parents with mental health disorders and things of that nature. So they were directly exposed to a particular issue and then wanted to pick a major that would help them not only contextualize their own experiences, but advocate for the people that they cared about directly. If my mother has bipolar disorder and my mother has had difficulty navigating the world by studying psychology, it may help me better connect with my mother, but also help her in her, um, in her time of need. Indirect exposure um, were uh, people who have not been directly affected, but are aware of the existence of these particular problems and feel called to do something within their own. And countering that, you had the design students um, who, for one, you have the lifelong creative. The person who grew up in a neighborhood or grew up in a family that continually encouraged them to uh, do creative things, uh, do creative camps, uh, paint, things of those natures. The convert, uh, someone who transitioned to design um, while still an undergrad or graduate school and excited by an experience that they had while working with a particular designer or caring more about it. And then you had the stability seeker, who is kind of like the lifelong creative but the stability seeker doesn't necessarily consider them, their talents to be something serious and simply only chose design as a career because they were told that they had to do something that would make money. Understanding all of this, I jumped into academia. Um, after publishing my papers, presenting at a few conferences, I got my first teaching job at LaRoche University and ultimately ended up in Texas, uh, where I started teaching first at Texas State University. During my time at Texas State University, I want to say my second year, uh, the George Floyd murder happened. Um, being the only black professor at the university of 80 faculty members and several thousand students, um, I was the unicorn in the room where everybody kind of looked at me and said, okay, Mar, so what are we going to do about the situation? Um, the discussion ended up... Sorry. The discussion ended up leading to me developing the State of Black Design Conference. Um, the initial proposal was, uh, Omari, we think this is a tragic situation. We all feel really bad about it. Can you get some of your black friends that are in design so we can talk to them about what it feels like to uh, suffer racism? To which I quickly responded by saying, hell no. Um, we're not going to do that. Nobody wants to do that. Um, instead, I surveyed what the field currently looked like. There were a lot of discussions around uh, the lack of black and brown faces at conferences hosted by AIGA, how, and several other organizations. Um, I decided that I was going to get a collection of my friends, but rather than it being a conversation of what it feels like to be marginalized, I was going to ask them specifically, now that you have a stage, what is it that you want to speak about? Um, I decided that I was going to articulate this conference and this symposium to our students on campus in the same vein that the students who chose social science fields wanted to hear. We were going to talk about this as being an opportunity to be change agents. We were going to talk about this as an opportunity to, to advocate for things that we cared about. 
and we were just going to allow people to dress and speak as they wanted to. If they wanted to drop F-bombs, they could. It did not have to be a formal situation. It did not have to feel super academic or buttoned up. Um, and this being something that was my first time around doing, I did not get any funding from my university to do so. Um, we didn't even get a page on the website, so I ended up building something on Eventbrite um, to invite people that went to the school. My expectation was that the small event was going to be just that, a small event, and was going to attract maybe at most 100 students. Um, we released this on Eventbrite. Again, I was expecting a room of students. I would have been happy with a room that mimics this. We ended up getting 5,000 people that ended up registering for the event internationally. Um, we even had studios from Sweden that would actually uh, that actually chimed in and then took live notes, um, like they drew their notes out as a, as a studio collectively and then sent it to us, uh, much of which was on uh, Twitter. But after that time period, um, it kind of reaffirmed my research uh, studies from, from undergrad. I began to think to myself, okay, um, I have an audience. What can I do with this? Uh, I then got contacted by several institutions and companies, again, being someone who got no money to start this with. Um, organizations like IBM, PayPal, Amazon, eBay, Adobe began the process of contacting me because they also wanted to be able to recruit students of color but had no idea how to connect to these, to these students. And the people that attended my conference we're really interested in finding out how do we connect to these Fortune 500 companies that we want to work for um, and also do some of the things that we still care about. How can we make a decent living working for a popular name but also continue advocating for the communities that we want to? Um, so when companies reached out to me and they said, hey, Amari, this is what we're hoping for. Can you help us do it? I said, bet. Um, let's do it in six months. Everybody looked at me like I was crazy, which I was. But um, we do an event in six months and partnered with IBM as our title sponsor. Um, we got sponsorship from several other institutions. And within six months, we threw an event where IBM was able to recruit more black and brown talent from one event than they had in the history of their design offices. It was so successful that they ended up being able to uh, talk about said success on a television series that I believe aired on ABC called America by Design and we were invited to South by Southwest where we presented on March 13th, 2022. Um, since then, sorry, going back, since then uh, we've been able to fundraise within three years a quarter million dollars. We've given out forty to fifty thousand dollars worth of scholarships to different students to assist with different needs. Um, we've had Guest speakers like Jelani Cobb, who is now, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, Jelani Cobb interned at The New Yorker with uh, Tom A.C. Coates, is currently the Dean of Journalism at uh, Columbia University, uh, Nikki Giovanni, and several other prominent speakers. Um, we've given out hundreds of certificate programs. Um, we have organizations like Google that provide certificate programs for development. We've been able to give out 500 of those certificates, not to mention certificates from city ventures as well as Salesforce for people that were hoping to, to, to continue their, their education. And this year, not this year, next year, we'll be throwing our fourth event in person, and this time we'll be doing it in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, in addition to that, I've been able to work with other organizations, such as Design Observer. How many of you guys have heard of Design Observer? Not enough hands, but it's okay. Um, I was invited to be the co-host of their mini sods with Kalina Sales, the chair of Tennessee State University's uh, design program. Um, and all of that brings me to this book project. Um, just for the sake of asking, well, giving a brief preface, this book is an anthology of essays that deal with the intersection of race and practice. Right. A bunch of the folks that participate in this book are talking about organizing um, while being designers, um, advocacy while being designers, as well as pedagogical approach and industry experience, um, all intersecting race and practice. Can anybody here tell me why that might be important? Why would a book like this be important? I mean, if anything, it's important for other people to have a place where you can realize 
that other people have experienced maybe similar things that you have and you know having a point to reach out or to look for other stories and to kind of have a starting place to understand that your story is can be reflected through other parts of design exactly um what about design textbooks and how design is taught does it is it you do you guys feel like it's fairly inclusive of all identities or it's or is it a pretty homogenous method of of going about things I feel like design academia has so many words and I can't keep up and they repeat the same things over and over but it doesn't like really talk about some of the like more important issues like who I'm designing for us, like like the specifics that I know that I'm used to as opposed to just like user. Really. Yes, I love that you mentioned that. So who we're designing for? Going back to my experiences growing up in New York City, I talked about this idea of positionality, being aware of cultural nuances and the people around us, right? Um, as a professor, one thing that I do, well, I don't even think I told you guys what I teach. Um, I'm a UX researcher um, by trade, and I teach UX research at uh, the University of North Texas. But with every project, I now start students with a positionality exercise where they have to map who they are, the intersections of their identity, and how that influences how they show up, how the world receives them, and how it helps them navigate particular problems. So for example, what we do is we'll create a list of things that we feel like contribute to our identities, right? That we intersect. We attribute a color to them, and then we actually divide the CMYK measurements based off of the number of potential answers that we can give. A greater example of that is, uh, if you look at the U.S. Census, under the U.S. Census, you have six categories for race, with Hispanic being the seventh, a subcategory. Um, if you divide this by seven, and for me, if I were to choose my racial identity marker, which is black, um, that would be three, the third. So I would divide that by seven, and I would multiply that in order to get a particular hue. So this is some of my graduate students currently doing that. But once you're done, you get this matrix of color, right? And it showcases the differences between everyone within a particular group. Um, we've broken it down based off of race, ability, race, ability, socioeconomic background, education, religious, religion, gender, age, and language. Once we've agreed on all of these categories, we've identified everyone's hue within these particular categories, we take the CMYK measurements for all of them, we add them up, and then we divide them by the number of categories that we've chosen in order to get everyone's particular hue. Um, this becomes an interesting visual that we then leverage in order to discuss the positional blind spots that we have, as well as the similarities. So you may notice that there may be people that have different racial identities, but when you combine all of the hues to see how they navigate the world, some of their colors may be closer uh, to someone of a different race than it would be of someone of the same race, especially when you consider some of the other differences. But how this then gets leveraged is once we talked about Okay, what are some of our similarities in terms of how we identify, um, how we navigate the world, how we're perceived, how we problem solve, things of that nature? I then give arbitrary discussions. Wait, oh, slides are out of whack. Okay, I then use it to then talk about user experiences that people have to go through and then navigate who is designing these experiences and how your positionality influences whether or not you're able to create an equitable experience or some of the difference. So I'll then ask everyone in the classroom to take a piece of paper, and I'll normally ask them to write down how many steps they have to take when going to a bathroom at a concert or a major sporting, sporting event, right? Um, does anybody want to guess how many steps the men take when going to a bathroom at a major sporting event? Does anybody? You mean like physical steps? Like how, like not, not steps as in like walking, but steps as in like I, I walk to the bathroom, step one. Oh, I see. I, I choose urinal or stall, step I see. two. Like, how many steps? Four. Four? <laughs> You're right. It is four. Oh. <laughs> it is four. Um, it's usually 50-50. It's half four, half three. Does anybody want to guess what the fourth step is? The oh, yeah. Perfect. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Because men are gross, uh, not all of us remember to wash hands. Uh, think about that when you guys are shaking hands and leaving today. <laughs> but anybody want to guess how many steps the women um, identify when going to a bathroom at a sporting event or a concert? 
on average, whenever doing this exercise? Anybody want to guess? Eight. It, it's eight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay, I spoke to them before the presentation. I needed to have a ringer. But no, for, uh, for women, when uh, attending the bathroom at major sporting events, um, we found that a lot of them normally flow between eight and twelve steps. Now, the eight and twelve steps uh, will be influenced by the type of clothes they wear, um, the type of baggage that they brought in, whether or not they're with child, expecting child, on their cycle, things of that nature, but that adds several additional steps. So normally, whenever I do this, and then I map these steps on the board for the men and the women, I'll usually look at all the additional steps of the women and then ask the men to raise their hand and say, hey, men, how many of you in the room feel like, without having a woman to help you understand these nuances, feel that you can equitably design an experience for women to use the bathroom? To which all of them will put their hands down, right? Rightfully so. There are aspects about being a woman that, being a man, you will never know, you'll never have the understanding of. Um, a lot of people like to say they'll empathize. I don't particularly care for that term, empathy, um, because sometimes I feel like people use it as a phrase to wear other identities as a costume, right? There's certain things that you're just not going to understand. Now, with the women, I then ask them to keep their hands up and say, how many of you feel that you can equitably design an experience for men? So which they all keep their hands up. And I use this as an opportunity to then say to them, there are aspects of your identity that is an out-group and in-group. Yeah, you have in-group and out-group identities, right? When you are in the in-group, your, your, your knowledge of the out-groups is minimal because you don't need it, right? Uh, how many folks in here are Android users? All right. <laughs> For the sake of technology, you guys are out-groups, right? Um, do you know what color uh, your text bubbles are when they go to <laughs> iPhone users? Do you, do you know the color? Green? Yeah, it's green. Um, how many of you guys are iPhone users? Do you know the color your text bubble shows up as for Android users? No. No. Right? So because you're in the in-group, because you're in the in-group, even with user experience items, you don't spend time actually considering what the experiences and the nuances are for the other people around you. For a lot of Android, for a lot of Apple iPhone users, there's this consistent complaint and nagging around the idea of, I don't want to look at no damn green text bubble. <laughs> without actually thinking that maybe there's an inverse bottleneck that the Android user is experiencing because you have an iPhone, but we don't give a damn because we're in the end group, right? For the women that are in the room, it's easier for them being in the out group to understand the nuances of the experience of the in group because society typically tends to lean more favorably towards the in group, right? And the in group doesn't necessarily have to pay the same amount of attention. So with the women that raise their hand confidently about how many of them feel like they could designed for men. Ladies in the room, can you put your hands in the air? Just for, just for the sake of an exercise. All right, what if we switched a part of the positional identity? What if it's no longer an able-bodied woman? Do you feel like you know all of the nuances of the experience that it would take to design an equitable bathroom experience? What if it's a trans woman? Do you see how as soon as you switch one aspect there now becomes this nuanced difference between um, what we understand the bathroom experience to be and what we feel confident that we're able to design for versus what we don't. There's a book called uh, Invisible Man by an author named Ralph Ellison. And Ralph Ellison talks about, uh, it, it was his fictional way of giving um, an idea of what it was like to live in the Jim Crow South, to be invisible because you were part of an outgroup, right? Um, navigating a particular space, being a part of an outgroup. Um, the reason positionality and the book itself is important is because it gives you an understanding of some of the nuanced experiences that people happen to have that are outside of yourselves, right? Um, how many of you guys feel as all, how many of you guys in here in general, if I was gonna make an assumption, are all aspiring designers? How many of you guys in here are not designers at all? Okay, so just one or two. All right, so for the aspiring designers in the room, how many of you feel like the things that you are going to be hired to design for are designing for yourself as an individual? Just one person. How many of you guys feel like it's a greater likelihood that you'll be designing for someone who's outside of your positionality? Awesome. 
how many of you guys feel that because you'll be designing for someone outside of your position now that it's important to understand um, what that experience is like? Perfect. Similar to the book, well, similar to the quote by Melissa Harris Perry in terms of sitting in a crooked room, uh, people from marginalized identities have long leveraged design and other pieces in order to advocate for themselves. This was an image from the Memphis uh, sanitation strike, I believe in 1963. Um, this was the sanitation strike in Memphis that happened right before MLK was um, assassinated at his motel. Um, this idea of I am a man was uh, a sign that was then uh, leveraged to kind of identify and advocate for humanity um, and, and, and equal treatment, right? Um, it was a way to advocate um, for, for being to be seen, right? You have NAACP who hung this flag until they were no longer able to. Um, whenever someone was lynched, advocating for the humanity of the person um, and, and, and calling attention to the humanity of the life that was lost. But stepping away from race, well, not yet, you still have issues um, within race due to the fact that people aren't necessarily taking the step of understanding positionalities outside of themselves. Um, where are you, how many people are of darker skin tone in here that have ever used the bathroom and put your hand underneath the automatic faucet and got nothing because it doesn't recognize dark skin tone? Perfect. Do you think that the person who designed that system you know, considered you specifically in that in that interaction or tested with you in mind? No. You fell within that positional blind spot. Um, or algorithm mistakes, where Google mistakenly tags black people as gorillas showing limits of algorithms, right? Stepping away from race, as I mentioned earlier. Or um, a magazine ad that was supposed to commemorate the Women's March after the Donald Trump inauguration, and instead of using the women's uh, symbol, actually used the men's symbol to commemorate the Women's March. <laughs> or the fact that women are the most likely to be uh, injured or severely injured in a car crash because for decades, uh, crash test dummies were actually well, crashes were tested using crash test dummies that were only built off of male anatomy. Or, when there was supposed to be an all-female-led uh, trip to space, but they had to cancel it because they never built spacesuits with women in mind. And because they didn't have a suit that would fit the women, they had to cancel it. Having an understanding of the positionality of the people that you're designing for is an extremely important task as a designer because as designers, it doesn't matter what your field is, whether you're a communication designer, product designer, fashion designer, we curate human existence. That's what it means to be a designer. We often struggle to identify that, um, to explain what that is, but that's exactly what we do. When you drive down the street, the signs that you see is curating your existence. When you pull your phone out, you're using your, your, your green or blue bubbles, whatever your preference is. Um, that's a designed experience. When you're eating at a restaurant, the silverware that you use, how your plates are laid out, the fashion that you wear in the wintertime, someone is curating all of these things for you, which all contribute to your culture, right? Your culture, how you show up in the world, how you navigate things. Someone designed that for you. But if you don't have the ability to consider the positionality of the person outside of yourself or take the steps necessary in order to learn more about folks outside of your own positionality, you have a situation where you can design out of your position of blind spots and end up harming someone else. Right? Silly question. Uh, how many of you guys know that there's a number of people that die every year that are left-handed using right-handed artifacts? Yeah, it's, it's actually a thing. As designers, um, especially designers who design product-based items, how many of you guys have ever designed something with the idea of transitional hands for ambidextrous audiences? Only two people. So that means the rest of you guys are contributing to the deaths of others. <laughs> it's, very, it's a very, very bad thing. <laughs> but we come to the Supreme Ordeal. Um, in the hero's journey, um, I know I skipped a couple steps, uh, but the Supreme Ordeal in the hero's journey is always where uh, these ideas come to a major conflict. Um, as a professor, I'm still relatively young, not compared to you guys. Um, I'm, I'm only 37, 
at every institution that I've worked. I've always been the youngest professor there. Um, I've always been uh, the bright-eyed. Any, you guys ever watch Abbott Elementary? Anybody here watch that? Yeah. I feel like I'm Kunta's character. Like the, the person who gets there who's always like super enthusiastic. I'm going to change the world. And all you need is hope, joy, and Skittles. And everything is going to be amazing. But as someone who focuses on this idea of positionality, some of the big problems we face currently or the biggest climax is the current political climate of the world that we live in, or the country that we live in. We have half the states in this country currently practicing anti-DEI initiatives. Um, and it's not simply just, uh, the, just the legislation itself, but if we are now saying that anything that focuses on diversity um, and passing the laws that are saying that we don't want to discuss difference anymore, or how difference can be leveraged in order to, to create innovation, um, that impedes the work. Or when we do revisionist history and start telling people that uh, things that were past atrocities are now beneficial uh, to the people who the atrocities were, were held against. So that's why, that's how I got to the point where I started doing the work that I do. And that's why I personally feel like books like the anthology are important books to be read and taken into consideration. And I'd like to thank you guys for humoring me. Um, if you guys want to connect them on LinkedIn or Instagram, feel free, either or. It's just my government name. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'd love to open for questions if you guys have any. Questions? Uh, I was just curious, this is absolutely fascinating, and I'd love to know some of examples of your specific work that you've done kind of in this vein. Uh, do you do a lot of work in the industry right now, or are you primarily focused on teaching? No, I do both. Um, I am a UX researcher for, well, I will be starting as a UX researcher for Blue Cross Blue Shields. Um, I worked as a UX researcher for Capital One for a little bit as well. Um, I do a lot of, uh, or have done a lot of work with outside of organizations, like um, I consulted with Unilever on their mailing product line, um, and uh, CMHA, kind of the kind of like a housing municipality authority. Acronyms that get too long, so <laughs> a bit hard for me. Um, but yeah, no, no, no. I um, I think there is a benefit to being in both industry and academia, right? Uh, the benefit of academia is that it's slow paced, um, and being in academia puts you in a position where you have the opportunity to study theory, create your own theories, innovate ideas, and to push. You have the time to stop and say, okay, this is what everyone is doing. Where are the inefficiencies and what's being done, and how do we work around that? Whereas opposed to industry. You don't always have that time, right? You, you you have deadlines based off of your clients. You have to make money for the company in order to keep the lights on and to keep the machine rolling, right? So when you work on the the cons, becomes in academia, if you don't have a space to practice your theory, um, then you don't know if it's just an ideal idea for it actually work. Um, but for industry. Um, if you can bring those theories in and they do work, you have space for innovation, right? So whenever you have professors that dabble between both industry and practice, I feel like you have a professor that can actually push both both areas, which I think do need to be pushed considerably. Yeah, I don't know if that made sense or if like I my... I think you clarified some things. Oh, yeah. just, I'm maybe curious on like any specific projects that you've worked on, but if you don't have the intuition. I mean, I could. Um, I also will tell you guys, I did fly in and got in really late last night, so I still have some brain fog. Um, <laughs> but um, no, I, I worked with CMHA on a project um, uh, that took place in Cleveland, Ohio, in the Wood Hill, Wood Hill Homes that used UX research methodologies in order to improve the quality of life for residents in the neighborhood. They were using the funding, uh, the funding of research from that, to apply for funding from HUD. Um, they, we ended up surveying, speaking to, um, doing ethnographic studies with the residents. 
Um, and not only did we uh, do it with them as subjects, we actually brought them in as equals. So whenever we were surveying land, spots, making decisions, we brought them with us and kept them as a parallel part of the decision-making ladder. By the time we were done, not only did they end up getting the $50 million grant necessary to improve the quality of life, but we then had something that had buy-in from the residents as well as um, the higher-ups who approved the decisions and plans that we were making. Um, while at uh, Texas State University, I worked on a project called Call and Response, where it was a critique on how design is traditionally practiced. Um, from my perspective, design and many other creative fields um, are top-down initiatives where someone um, comes up with an idea or a concept and then shares and distributes that idea to everyone else and people buy into it and then decide that this is going to be the next wave. Rather than taking time to ask people at the very bottom, what should we prioritize collectively? Um, call and response is a African tradition where um, I say something out, something comes back to me. Um, it's, it's a conversational piece and it's often used in black churches um, or in sporting events, right? Um, many of you guys are familiar with uh, Ohio State. I know Penn State is a big football team here, so I'm not going to do the o o OH thing. But if I do that and you yell back IO, that is also a call and response. And we talked about how do we make that a design practice within itself. If I put a call out to the audience who's a prospective user, how do they respond to me with something that we now create collectively, not necessarily something from the top down? Um, I also worked with um, the Idea Charter School while at UNC last semester. It was the one year anniversary from the Baldy shooting, um, which was 30 to 40 minutes south of where I was teaching at Texas State University. Um, but it was how can we leverage UX research methodologies to lower uh, casualties in active shooting scenarios um, in K-12 schools and increase safety for all. Um, so it was our opportunity to then take into account the positionalities of all the stakeholders. Um, the parents, uh, the students, um, the administrators, the police officers, and the uh, journalists that would be uh, reporting this type of information. What are all the systems that they have to fall within? How do we get them to work collectively in a proposed plan that will actually increase safety, keep everyone informed, and evacuate um, people in necessary uh, fashions? Uh, some of our students came up with really intricate ideas. I didn't realize until towards the end of that semester that there are actual systems that can track the decibel measurements of bullets. Um, and when you connect them with other uh, pieces of technology, you can not only identify the type of bullet, but identify the type of gun that fires it, the amount of ammunition that that gun um, fires in the direction of that bullet. So if you put enough of these systems around a particular school, you can now create a system that whenever a bullet is fired, um, it can inform uh, emergency responders where the bullet came from, what type of gun, how many bullets were fired, and how many potentially could be left within the clip that's being fired. So those are some of the projects that I've worked on. Cool, thank you. No problem. Any other questions for Mari? Buddy? I, can I ask anybody? Okay. Oh, oh go ahead, you go, you go. <laughs> I was gonna ask you. I guess with the idea of like recognizing positionality is something that has like come up before this idea of like the danger of like appropriating and like making those assumptions of people with different positionalities and like I'm sure like when you go through social you go through ethnographic studies, but like for a student I guess, or even like someone just entering the industry, I feel like the only exposure to diversity is like if your team is diverse. How do you like, are there like w other ways as like us as designers can properly learn about other youth like uh, positionalities without a degree of making assumptions? I don't know. Well, I don't necessarily feel like assumptions on their own are bad. I think everything is an assumption until it's validated. And when you look at assumption as being something that has to be validated, not necessarily that you go off of, I feel like that's, that's normally the right approach to take. Um, I think positionalities are beneficial um, because it puts you in a position where you have to account for self, um, your own personal blind spots, right? Um, as a man, um, I know that there are particular things that I am unaware of, right? 
there are particular identities that because I'm not members of that community or because I have not grown up in particular circumstances that I am not going to know all the ins and outs and nuances of these particular things, right? Um, if I have these positional blind spots and I am designing and I don't account for them, it makes it very hard for me to design something that is inclusive of others. Now, if I have a team and there's somebody on my team that has awareness in the areas that I'm blind, it now begins this conversation around how can we work together to make sure that we're designing something that's equitable for all parties, right? If there's no one on my team that has that positional awareness, it gives me the opportunity to build the relationship with somebody who does in order to include them. So it's less a matter of, I'm gonna do this, and because I'm doing this, I'm uh, believing, well not believing, I am relieving any possibility of assumptions being made. It's, I am, as a human being, stuck with my own limitations based off of my own experiences. That doesn't make it bad, but these are my limitations. I need to partner with someone who has awareness in the areas that I do not in a collaborative manner in order to find that innovation and design something more equitably. So it's more of me saying we are going, it's more of me suggesting it as a method of problem solving um, collaboratively than doing something singularly. Does that make sense? Because if you're building out personas, not personas, if you're building out positionalities for other people um, without the person being there and part of the decision-making process, then it doesn't make it much different than personas. And while I feel like personas have their place in research, I also feel like, for sake of example, you guys are college students. How many of you guys have dating apps for a pause? That's okay, I'm not gonna try to match with you. Put your hands up, but uh, if, you, if you have or had had a, a dating profile at any point in time. Only one person, two, three? Everybody in here should be raising their hands, right? Okay. Now, here's a question. Um, whenever, we, whenever we draft personas or have drafted personas in the past, they typically include what? Like your interests, your age, um, maybe race, political affiliation, so forth and so forth. Um, comparable to like a dating profile app, right? Now, let's say, uh, Renee, um, I don't know what's on your dating profile. But if, if I did not know you, and I was to design a solution for you, looking solely at your dating profile, how spot on do you think I would be able <laughs> to be just looking at your dating profile? Probably pretty spot on. You sure? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know me. You might be able to help. <laughs> but, but, all right. So, but I, but I know you. If I didn't know you, but looking at your uh, dating profile, I may get some professional information that doesn't require me to engage with you any further, to understand the nuances of who you are, your preferences, and so forth and so forth. So on my dating profile, I don't have one, but if I had one, um, and it said, I say I like puppies, right? If someone who was designing, I do like puppies, but um, <laughs> but that that's never been on a dating profile. But if, if, if I put down that I do like puppies, and I have a first date, and the person who uh, is taking me out on this date as a designer, and she decides that she wants to do something for me and surprises me with a puppy without understanding that, oh, I don't live in a space that allows puppies, uh, my job doesn't necessarily uh, permit for these types of things, she just made a decision based off of superficial information. It's a sweet gesture, but is it effective in terms of uh, meeting the goal that she had? Not necessarily. With positionality, it forces you to kind of step outside of the superficial interface that we create. Um, and forces us to engage with the communities that we're designing for so that we're continuously learning more about them and learning those nuances. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, in the beginning, when you're talking about uh, social science and how like that attracts more black students, let's say something like design, um, I thought that was interesting how like social science and social science theory obviously loves itself to work that has a greater social impact. And I, I see how that translates easily to UX design and, and UX research, but how would you say that other forms of design that are seemingly more like technical and I guess surface level, like communication design, or I'm, I'm a communication design major, so that's what I'm thinking of. How would you say that? Um, I yeah. guess like you could borrow this type of research and theory and, and apply it to to these other forms of design? Yeah, no, I think it definitely does. I think um, the way that it 
as a, as a communication designer, um, or as a fashion designer, product designer, or architect, everything that you design no longer sits within the confines of your region that you're in, right? It perpetuates ideas, it has influence, and especially if you're working for a Fortune 500 company, it then travels, right? Um, if you have no idea of the audience that you're working with, um, you sometimes can stumble into these issues where you create greater PR problems, right? An example of this was a couple years ago, um, H&M had a campaign um, where they showed a young black child in a hoodie that said, coolest monkey in the yard, or coolest monkey in the jungle, something to that extent, right? Um, Fendi, or was it Gucci? No, Fendi, um, had a, a noose uh, hoodie. Um, Gucci had uh, blackface trinkets, right? Um, in 2008, I believe, uh, Vogue magazine had LeBron James on the cover of the magazine holding a Brazilian model um, in the same fashion that uh, the World War II poster, um, Killed the Beast, um, had a large gorilla holding a, a white damsel in distress, right? So you now have these uh, things that are happening. They could be out of malice or they could be out of lack of knowledge of, 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 of these cultural things that, that create issues. Um, outside of the PR aspects, you could use this awareness of the communities that you're designing for to make more pointed designs. Um, an example of this, uh, make more pointed designs or even make things that uh, have more poignant uh, experiences for others. Um, I know you guys are relatively young, and I believe it was out of business by the time you guys started going to school here, but how many of you guys remember Complic Kitchen? No. No? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes or no? Complic Kitchen. I've never seen pictures of it. Is it yeah. fun? <laughs> Brett, Brett's problem. <laughs> it's, not, it's not my project. I, I just did the design for it. <laughs> I have another bringer in the room. Um, but no, Complic Kitchen utilized designs, uh, print materials, in order to expose people to cultures that were outside of themselves, especially the cultures uh, that America happened to be in conflict with at that point in time. Um, as as, as uh, communication designers, in many regards, we, um, we are establishing what are the in-groups and out-groups, culturally, right? Um, as communication designers, we're often designing and, and building what's a luxury service, what's a good service, what's a bad service. And all of it, a lot of times, is influenced by those ads that we see, um, or the packaging that we see, um, so forth and so forth. Uh, there, there are copious studies uh, that talk about that. Um, so yeah, having an understanding of the positionality. Of one example, there is a... Uh, my thesis advisor who spoke here at Carnegie Mellon years ago, Ken Misaki O'Grady and his wife Jen um, Misaki O'Grady had a book. They talked about in one of their case studies, um, there was a grocery store in the UK where people, um, although they could not afford to buy the name brand items at the grocery stores, refused to buy the off-brand stuff that was, you know, the grocery store stuff, um, due to the fact that they didn't want to look poor. But when they actually spent more money grocery store, the brand itself, on the packaging around said brand, people actually started buying it versus buying the main brand stuff because the packaging around it actually felt uh, just as good. Um, so when you have the understanding of the folks that are actually making these purchases, you can actually push behavioral choices a little bit more, right? So for example, I don't shop at Walmart, but if I did, I would never buy Walmart's uh, off-brand stuff um, because I don't trust it, but I would buy it from Target. Um, and part of it is because I'm naive enough to believe that because they took time to develop a quality brand product for these things, then maybe it's safe to actually consume. Um, naive because it's probably just as bad for me. But for a lot of other people, understanding that positionality helps make a better decision in terms of how this was delivered. Extent you know what to do, like people, and uh, find a way to understand that perspective that you 
personally don't uh, know very much about, but if you're unaware of perspectives that you're unaware of, how do you go about figuring that out? Sometimes it becomes a, a line of question. Um, well, sometimes it depends on the product that you're working on. So for example, um, with Blue Cross Blue Shield, I was asked, how do you design a, um, an app that will make it easier for the elderly, for elderly parties to then find a prescription and make all types of uh, pharmaceutical-based purchases, right? Um, and the challenge that I gave when given my presentation on how to do this was how many people in the room actually happen to fall within the age demographic of the audience that we're trying to design for, right? Um, to which no one was able to raise their hand. I brought my grandmother up as an example. My grandmother is um, 50, 90, so. Um, but when my grandmother was younger, um, if she wanted to make a phone call to somebody, she would have called an operator, and the operator should have do the whole rotary dial thing. She had to call the operator, and the operator had to patch her into someone else, um, like literally patch her into the call itself. So if we understand technology based off of what we've been exposed to and what we've grown up with, and we're designing for someone else who did not grow up with anything similar to that technology, there is a positional breakdown. Um, and putting yourself in this, putting yourself in a seat and then asking what is the difference in exposure that I have in navigating these particular problems versus the person that I'm designing for. Um, and then when answering that question for, for Blue Cross Blue Shields, the thing that I mentioned is, if you're gonna design this for that audience, you first have to have an account of how familiar are they with the technology that they're utilizing? Um, what did they grow up with? How many people do they have in their household? How many people are younger individuals? Because if it's an elderly person who's living alone and they don't have a younger grandchild or a younger son that they can call and help them navigate that technology, um, is it going to be an easy ask, or do we have to rethink? Do we have to rethink how we're delivering this in general if we're expecting this to be successful? Right? Um, if my grandmother predates commercial sales of computers, and now we're having something that's more powerful than the first computer that she's ever seen. Um, not ever seen. Something more powerful than the first computer that was being retailed in her lifetime, the, the first computer that was being retailed in her lifetime, um, expecting her to be able to navigate that um, at her age might be a bit intimidating. It might be something that she does not want to engage with. So what other options do we present for her? Does that make sense? We have, we have time for one more question. Does anybody have one more? Or I can ask a question. <laughs> My question. All right, thank you, first of all, for coming. This be great. Um, so our students here, super smart. Um, they're also really good citizens, or are actually working to become really good citizens. They leave us, and they've got to get a job. And they, they have to get a job, because they, they either have debt, or their parents are in their ear, or it's an immigration thing. They, they have to get a job. Can you speak to, um, I'm just really interested in what you would say to a 22-year-old kid who has all these really super important things floating around their head and then has to go work at a company that might not share or uh, appear to share those kind of values and how they match that into, I've got to work, but this company doesn't align with everything that I'm, that I'm feeling. It's going to happen. Um, <laughs> I think um, it's not, not to answer you guys don't want to hear, but uh, the reality of the situation. Well, stepping back, my mentor often told me that your twenties, uh, after you graduate from college, is your opportunity to build your reputation. Right. Um, you're trying to build your connections, build your reputation, and a lot of times in that time period, you'll be doing a lot of front work, you'll be doing a lot of things that you don't necessarily want to do, and it's because you're young. Um, and people look at you as being young, not knowing much. So you have to fight and scrape for every little bit that you want, right? Once you get into your early 30s, you've begun to be a proven commodity. So now people trust you a little bit more. So you can now push back when you're given front work. A little bit, not a lot. Right? Um, the longer you work, the more pushback you can give. But if you're building your reputation and you have a track record of success, people give you more space. By the time you get into your 40s, you've now been working for 20 years. You can give considerable pushback and you're probably in a leadership role, leadership capacity. 
um, to where you can determine how things are looking, hopefully, right? Um, or you have the resume necessary to work for the spaces that you want to be doing the type of work that you want to do. Um, by the time you're in your 50s, you're kind of mentoring someone else to step in and do what it is that you were doing, right? And you're, you're, you're at the tail end of your career. Um, unless you're in academia, and as my senior faculty member Michael Gibson tells me all the time, they're going to have to cart, make, cart my dead body out of the classroom. Right? Um, but a lot of times when you're in your 20s, you find yourself doing a lot of things that you didn't necessarily envision yourself doing, but it's a part of the process. Um, what I would say is find outlets for the things that you are passionate about outside of work. For me, um, I did a lot of writing. I went to a lot of conferences. I connected and networked with the people that were doing the work that I wanted to do. I treated a lot of people to lunch because I wanted to hear more about it. I asked for everybody and their mom to be my mentor, literally. Um, you know, my, yeah, I asked everybody to be my, to be my mentor and give me advice and tell me more about what it was that they were doing and how they got where they were. Um, and being consistent and showing up, building those relationships, fostering relationships and consistently building those bridges helps you get from that space of, man, this shit sucks, to, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm really content with where I am right now. Thank you so much.